Okay, and so the last topic we're going to talk about for this chapter is enzyme regulation. Um, this is by far one of the most widely studied and complicated aspects of enzymes is how they are how they are regulated. Everything is kind of interconnected in your body. But the whole idea is like sometimes you want an enzyme to be working perfectly at optimal, you know, at optimal reaction rate. And other times it might not be needed. So you're going to ask it to stop working or maybe to the point where if it kept on going, it would be problematic. So if we just think about like, um, we have an enzyme that takes two monosaccharides together and links them up to create a polysaccharide where it's gonna store that sugar. Well, you want that enzyme to be working when you have way too much sugar in the cell such that you could you should be storing some of it, but you don't want that enzyme to be doing that if there isn't a lot of sugar in the cell, right? If that sugar is needed for energy, you don't want this enzyme that packages it into a polysaccharide to be working. So this is this idea of enzyme regulation. And we're gonna talk about some general features that are common um, that a lot of different enzymes have. Okay, so first of all is this idea of cofactors. Um, there's also a similar idea of coenzymes. These are things that are needed uh, to help catalyze a, uh, a reaction. So for example, a simple enzyme wouldn't need any cofactors or any coenzymes. It would be able to, for example, take a sugar and break it in half without the need of anything else. Okay, there are these things called cofactors, which are usually metal ions or other small molecules that might be needed for an enzyme to do its function. Okay, so for example, um, an oxidation reaction is something that's commonly catalyzed by metal ions. So oxidase enzymes might require a metal ion in order to, uh, to function correctly. So this metal ion would be called a cofactor. The idea of a coenzyme is essentially the same thing, except for they tend to be larger, such as a small organic molecule or a vitamin. A vitamin is a coenzyme that's required for many chemical reactions. Okay, so how does it work? Basically, it just needs to be there for the enzyme to do its job correctly. So this is a good sort of pictorial example. We have this, um, inactive enzyme. And in this case, the cofactor has to bind in order for the substrate to be able to bind, right? So the active site doesn't fit the substrate unless the cofactor is in there first. So then this cofactor binds, then the substrate can bind and allow that enzyme to do its job, which is to convert the substrate to product. Um, this is an example where it helps it bind. It might do something else. It doesn't always help it bind. It could actually play a role in catalyzing the reaction like we talked about for the metal ions and oxidation reactions. Bottom line is the cofactors required for the enzyme to be able to do its job. Okay, it is also not going to be consumed though. So it's not going to be converted from um, like to a product. Okay. Other aspects of enzyme regulation. So we can regulate an enzyme by either increasing the reaction rate that that enzyme, you know, is doing its job converting substrate to reaction to reactant, or like what, you know, the flip side is we can decrease the reaction rate when a substance is not needed by the cell. Okay, so these can be done. Uh, there's a few different things we're going to talk about. Allosteric enzymes, let me actually use a different color. Allosteric enzymes, this idea of feedback control and covalent modifications are all different methods of enzyme regulation. So what is an allosteric enzyme? So an allosteric enzyme is uh, an enzyme that's regulated from something binding to an allosteric site. And the big difference here is that the allosteric site is different from the active site. Okay, what it's gonna, what it does is this, this regulator binds to this allosteric site and changes the shape of that protein. Okay, so for example, I have, I mean, I'm gonna probably butcher this, but let's just go for it. I have something like a little Miss Pac-Man that has this allosteric site. <laughs> 
And then when something binds to that allosteric site, let me actually do it like this. It changes. So now my allosteric site has that, um, that substrate bound to it or that regulator bound to it. And then it's changed the 3D shape of the active site in this case, right? So here was my active site. And now here is my active site. Right. Importantly, the allosteric site is further is different than the active site. Um, Allosteric regulators can either be positive, so maybe I change the shape of my active site so that it fits the substrate better, or maybe it's a negative regulator where I, this allosteric site is bound and then the active sites change so it no longer fits the substrate, right? So you could do either. Either would be considered allosteric regulators. Importantly, though, the allosteric site is different from the active site. Okay, so great. This was a much better picture than what I did. But yes, so here we go. We have, here's the allosteric site different from the active site. In a positive allosteric regulation, you have your molecule bound to the active, uh, to the allosteric site. And now it makes it so that the substrate actually fits into that active site even better. Or we can have the reverse where the negative allosteric regulator, now we have our molecule binding to the active or to the allosteric site and making it so that the substrate no longer fits in that active site. Okay, um, this fits into this broader theory of feedback control. Okay, so this is this idea of if we have a, a set of enzymes that are each catalyzing reaction like one after the other. So this enzyme catalyzes a reaction, then this one grabs the product from that reaction, catalyzes it. The third enzyme grabs the product from that reaction, catalyzes it. This would create what's, or this could create what's called a feedback control, where the end product of that series of reactions acts as a negative regulator to the first enzyme in that series. Okay, so let's see what I mean by that. So here we go. Here we have an allosteric site that's empty and an active site for our enzyme. The enzyme binds the substrate that creates this product here. That product is then grabbed by a ne uh, the next enzyme, which then converts it into something else. That is then grabbed by this third enzyme, which converts it into something else. So now we have uh, the, four the fourth compound in this series. And then this, the last compound produced, acts as a negative regulator and goes back and binds to that allosteric site of that first enzyme in the sequence, basically turning it off, right? So the whole idea being is that this is a series of reactions where now once we have enough product at the end, we don't really need it to keep on going down the line. So turn off that first machine. Uh, we got enough of our end goal here. Okay, so this is this idea of feedback control where the last product in a series will act as a negative regulator to the first enzyme in that series. Another thing that we could do to enzymes is to covalently modify them. Okay, so to add covalently add a compound on there which will transform it into either being um, functional or non-functional depending on the covalent modification. These covalent modifications are reversible. So if you have an enzyme that makes a covalent modification, there will be another enzyme that removes that covalent modification. Um, there is this class of enzymes, zymogens or proenzymes, which are actually created in an inactive form. They are created in such a way that they have this covalent modification and they require another enzyme, enzyme to remove that covalent modification, or I guess it could be, or add a covalent modification in order to activate it. 
So they're actually synthesized in an inactive form. Usually that's because they're going to be transported from one part of the cell to another part of the cell or even from one cell to another cell. So you create this enzyme that's inactive so that you, it doesn't start doing its job until it gets to the right place. Then you covalently modify it and allow it to do its job. One really common example of, of uh, um, covalent modifications is phosphorylation, all right? So adding a phosphate group or removing a phosphate group um, is a really common way of regulating enzymatic activity. And it could go either way. So there's an example of, uh, here's an example where I start off with an inactive enzyme and then I add a phosphate group creating an active enzyme. Remember we talked about kinases as being those, I told you that they were a really important group um, because they do, well, you just see them a lot because of this type of regulation is really important, okay? So a kinase is gonna be adding a phosphate group and creating an active enzyme. Um, you may have it so that the phosphorylated form is inactive. And then having a phosphatase would catalyze the removal of that phosphate group, creating an active enzyme, okay? And just FYI, what do I mean by a phosphate group? Whoops. That would be this here. And these are attached through what are called phosphoester bonds. Basically what would happen is I would create a bond to this oxygen here. So this would be a phosphate group that's been added to a molecule or I can have one that removes it. Okay. Um, real quick, let's just sort of, because this is, I, I kind of mentioned about that categorization of enzymes and how that's particularly um, an annoying topic. Let's just think about what these two classes of enzymes would be, a kinase or a phosphatase. So just going back here, let me just point out. Where is it? Okay, so the kinases were an example of a transferase reaction. You're transferring that phosphate group from what was probably ATP, to be honest, to this enzyme. So that would be a transfer ACE. So again, just kind of trying to get good at thinking about these categories. And what about a phosphatase, the removing of that, phosph uh, that phosphate group? That is an example of a hydrolase. So a phosphatase breaking this phosphoester bond, you would do that by adding water, creating like ROH and then your phosphate group. So this would be an example of a hydrolase. Okay. Isoenzymes. So these are enzymes that have slightly different forms, but they catalyze the same reaction and they're in different cells or tissues of the body. Okay, so uh, lactate dehydrogenase in, is an example where if you took lactate dehydrogenase, which converts lactate to pyruvate, if you took uh, and sort of write this reaction here, not something that I expect you to know off the top of your head, but just hopefully we can see from this reaction. Um, if you took cells from the heart, you would see that the lactate dehydrogenase is slightly different in its composition in terms of the polypeptide chains than it is if you took it from the liver cells or something like that, okay? And they're really not dramatically different, but nonetheless, they have slightly different, um, slightly different forms of this enzyme, meaning different polypeptide chains, depending on the tissue that you find it in. 
Um, so lactate dehydrogenase, it actually has four subunits, four different polypeptide chains that are folded and then arranged in a quaternary structure. So it turns out that if you looked in the heart or kidneys, you would see one. So there's two different possibilities of those, uh, those polypeptide chains. We're going to sort of abbreviate them H and M. I have no idea where that comes from, but I'm sure there's some logic to that. Um, it turns out that if you took cells from the heart, you would have the 4H version where all those different subunits match that H polypeptide chain. Whereas if you looked in red blood cells, the LDH, the lactate dehydrogenase would consist of four polypep or three polypeptide chains of the H designation and one of the M. You go to the brain, it's two H's and two M's, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So depending on which tissue you grab this particular enzyme from, you might find that it has a slightly different polypeptide makeup. Uh, why would this, the body do that? Presumably to help sort of recognize where this particular form should go. So if I create a bunch of the M polypeptide chain, that means that my liver is in need of lactate dehydrogenase, where if I contain, uh, produce a lot of the H polypeptide chain, that's a signal that my heart needs that particular enzyme. Okay. All right, so then the flip side or, or a, a, a type of enzyme regulation would be this idea of enzyme inhibition. Okay, so this idea that we're going to make it so that enzymes don't work as well as they otherwise would. Um, and in particular, we're going to be talking about reversible and irreversible inhibition and this idea of competitive versus non-competitive inhibition. Okay, so inhibitors are anything that cause any molecule that will cause a loss of catalytic activity from an enzyme. So this can either be one of those allosteric type regulators that we were talking about, or an enzyme that actually fits into the active site, or, I'm sorry, or a molecule that actually fits into the active site of the enzyme and prevents any substrates from binding. We can classify all inhibitors as either reversible or irreversible. Reversible means just that, the, the effects can be reversed. Irreversible means that you have permanently inhibited that enzyme, maybe even permanently deactivated it or turned it off, and it, it's awaiting to be broken down by the body. Okay, so yeah, reversible inhibition, again, that just means that the enzyme activity can be restored. So reversible enzyme activity can be restored. Um, they, we could see different types of these. So again, we talked about those allosteric sites. So we could have an allosteric inhibitor or uh, one that binds to the active site. That would be a competitive inhibitor. Um, but importantly, these aren't covalent modifications that occur. Um, yeah, so a non-competitive inhibitor would be one that acts in a site other than the active site. Remember, we called those allosteric sites. If it does, if this inhibitor does interact with the active site of the protein, we call that a competitive inhibitor. So a competitive inhibitor interacts with the active site or competes for the active site. Um, competitive inhib inhibitors are molecules that look a lot like the substrate, at least to the enzyme, right? So that's why it is just as easily able to fit into the active site, but importantly, it's not going to react or form any product. So normally this is sort of the normal situation where we have an enzyme, it binds its substrate, forms the enzyme substrate product, uh, enzyme substrate complex, that then is converted to the enzyme product complex, which dissociates and you get product. Well, if we have an inhibited enzyme, we have our inhibitor bind to that active site. All right, so here's our inhibitor. Now it's bound to the active site, preventing the substrate from binding, okay? It's called a competitive inhibitor because it competes for that active site, right? 
So if you have a really low concentration of inhibitor, it's not really gonna do much. But if you have a very high concentration of inhibitor, it's going to outcompete that substrate for those active sites and thus slow that chemical reaction down greatly, right? So we can tune just how much inhibition we want by changing the, the uh, concentration of the inhibitor. Likewise, if we do have an inhibitor present and we want to increase the reaction rate, we could also increase the substrate concentration, right? The one with the higher concentration is going to be the one that can outcompete the other. All right, so just some examples of competitive inhibitors. Um, Sussinate and malinate. Malinate is an inhibitor, a competitive inhibitor, and notice how it has a very similar structure to our actual substrate, but is slightly different. Likewise, um, here is another example of a substrate and an inhibitor. And again, just kind of to point out how similar they are in structure. That's why it's able to, to get into that active site. Okay. A non-competitive inhibitor is going to be one that doesn't have to have a similar structure to the substrate because it's not going to bind to the active site. So remember, we talked about these um, does not compete for active site. We'll say binds to allosteric site. Right, so these are inhibitors that don't have to look anything like the substrates because they bind to a completely different site. They bind to an allosteric site and then change the shape of that enzyme in such a way that prevents the substrate from binding to that active site, okay? Um, yeah, so we, we sort of already talked about these when we talked about allosteric sites. All right. Reversible inhibition is when an enzyme is activity is destroyed either by, a, or I'm sorry, irreversible inhibition is an enzyme activity that's destroyed because an inhibitor has been covalently bound um, somewhere on the protein. So either by com, uh, covalently binding a competitive inhibitor to the, uh, to the active site or covalently binding um, some inhibitor to an allosteric site. Either of these can be done in such a way that would permanently or irreversibly inhibit a protein. And it's usually, I mean, it's at that point, it's a signal to the cell that this protein needs to go. Its job is done. We've turned it off. Get it, get it to the disposal mechanisms. Um, Examples of irreversible inhibitors. So actually cyanide is something, it's actually a toxic that was used in um, sort of chemical warfare back in the day when we didn't really have all good grasp on handling chemical weapons. But the thing, the reason why cyanide is so poisonous is because it tends to uh, react with your enzymes in such a way that will permanently inhibit them. So by breathing in cyanide, you're essentially like turning off all these enzymes in your body so they're no longer doing their job. Other sort of more uh, generic ones, you can have certain drugs which will irreversibly inhibit an enzyme activity um, or an insecticide or a fungicide. So things that are specific to killing insects or funguses these could also be irreversible inhibitors. They turn off some key reaction within this bacteria or this insect or this fungus or whatever it may be. Uh, importantly, these would be molecules that don't affect humans. They only affect a specific function within, within whichever organism you're trying to stop. Okay. Um, so just a little summary here. We have this summary of competitive versus non-competitive and then irreversible inhibitors. So for a competitive inhibitor, the shape of the inhibitor is the same as the substrate. So similar shape to the substrate, whereas non-competitive inhibitors, they do not have to be similar. If it's irreversible, it may or may not be similar. It depends on where that inhibitor is binding to. Um, the important part of the irreversible inhibitor is that it forms a covalent bond with the enzyme, which is why it's irreversible. Um, 
when we're talking about competitive inhibitors binding, they bind to the active site, whereas non-competitive inhibitors, I don't know why they stopped using this term, but we want to use this term, they will bind to an allosteric site. Okay, in terms of reversibility, so clearly the irreversible is not, it's not reversible, that's the whole logic behind it. For reversing an, a competitive inhibitor, we can do that by adding more substrate concentration, right? Because then the substrate will be allowed to outcompete that competitive inhibitor. Non-competitive inhibitors are not reversed by adding substrate concentrate, by adding more substrate concentration because they don't bind to the same site, but they can be ch chemically changed in such a way that removes the inhibitor. So, you know, the cell can essentially just start removing that inhibitor if it doesn't want to inhibit that reaction anymore. Okay. All right, so our learning check, identify and describe an inhibitor that is either competitive or non-competitive. If it increases, increasing substrate reverses inhibition, that is a competitive inhibitor. It binds to the enzyme surface, but not the active site. That's a non-competitive inhibitor. Structure is similar to the substrate that is competitive because it's fitting in that active site. And inhibition is not reversed by adding more substrate. That would be the signature of a non, whoops, competitive inhibitor. Okay, awesome. 